Mars community traditionally is that pretty much ever since the Viking uh, it's been heavily uh, dominated by the geology community and the surface. Uh, my colleague Andy Nani calls them Hug the Rock people. Uh, it's, uh, and it's a, a fact of life that when you're focused on a certain sub-area of planetary science, you tend to try to find all the answers there. And so for a very long time, because of this uh, dominance, and also it's partly because of the surface of Mars is so compelling and so visible, and you can find all these wonderful pictures of it, that people tended to focus on solid Mars. Uh, and the atmospheric group kind of uh, divided on the side. And of course, because of this, uh, the answer to the question of what happened to Mars' atmosphere and its water and so forth, uh, the answers were being sought in the surface, in the ice caps, and the subsurface, and from the crust, and so forth. Um, but as you will hear as we go on, uh, there's more and more of a way of evidence just in the state space. And so the timing of Maven is excellent, and that is now um, going into orbit at a time when people are really appreciating that escape had to play a major role in Mars climate history. So what I'm going to do is pick up uh, where Nick left off and go into a little more um, of some of the details of that story. For perspective, of course, we have to keep always in mind that the planet's been around at least four and a half billion years. Um, and we've only been around a few hundred thousand years, and the space, space age is really only five decades old. So we've only got a pretty modern sample of uh, Mars and only so much time that we've been thinking about it. And uh, even the history of the Earth is poorly understood and reconstructing the doing the detective work to reconstruct that history has been very challenging even when we're here and access to every sample we could possibly want and every modern tool that we could possibly want. So Maven's job is to try to get uh, a little further from the very hand-waving speculative kinds of thinking that's going on and to uh, actually obtain some key constraints for Mars that will allow us to, to make much more solid arguments about understanding how Mars got to be what it is. If you think about the exoplanet business, for example, those of you who looked at the Kepler site, websites and presentations, there's all these planetary systems being discovered out there. And yet here we are with our own neighboring terrestrial planets that are so diverse and we don't really understand how they all got that way. And it just makes you wonder for those exoplanets, and in particular terrestrial exoplanets, how many other different versions and varieties there are. And it's all related, in fact, to their evolutionary histories as well as their central stars. So going back again, uh, what you know is that much evidence points to this earlier, more hospitable Mars, a wetter one. And uh, as Nick said, it could be uh, that some of that atmosphere was and or is buried, buried and or frozen in the polar caps, or that it escaped space. And so uh, as I was saying, that there is evidence accumulating, including uh, isotopic measurements, uh, which many will go into in detail in the next talk, uh, that are beginning to point more and more strongly to Number two, uh, is a very important factor. And the question is, uh, can escape to space do the job? So what we had, uh, what you find in the literature is timelines like this of Mars history. And uh, this particular one uh, emphasizes uh, in the early era of Mars uh, about evolution that the atmosphere was subject to a very hostile environment that impacts, uh, significant impacts provided. And many people um, over the years have decided that impacts could have done the whole job. If you didn't do anything else afterwards. 
but now there is all this accumulating evidence that there was still uh, plenty of stuff around at the time that it exercised. And so we can't say anything about this, uh, this era of great impacts very much, uh, other than the fact that our story starts after the era of impacts. It starts when Mars is modern Mars, and however its atmosphere might have been in different composition as well as thickness. We don't, uh, don't know too much about that yet. There are models of what, what has happened. We're trying to flesh out this, this modern Mars story since we know there was this time at the end of impacts and before the present when things looked like they were really hospitable. Can I just ask you a question? Go back to that slide. So you're saying from the present to about, you don't have a number there, about three, less than three and a half billion. Are you talking about? Billions? Impacts are about uh, half a billion, first half a billion to a billion years, major impacts. And then, so we, we really start our thinking timeline at about 3.5 billion years ago. Okay, a little bit to the right. Yeah, this shifts around. Just want to clarify. This shifts around. Uh, there was a, an early era also when uh, the sun was, oh, I will get into this <laughs> next story. As, the sun, early sun was different enough that it caused some processes that may not be active today. Uh, but um, we will see that story uh, evolve here. Uh, and so the bottom line is that escape has to occur through the upper atmosphere. And that is Megan's domain. Uh, and in fact, the whole atmosphere of Mars is almost an upper atmosphere from the Earth's perspective because the pressure on the surface is equivalent to the stratospheric pressure on Earth, approximately. So that it would be as if you were living in the stratosphere, if you were uh, a Marsman. Uh, we have um, cartoons like this of the Mars atmosphere density profiles and temperature profiles and pressure profiles compared to Earth. You can find these on the web. Uh, this one is from the last website, if you're interested in numbers. Um, but everyone appreciates by now that the Mars atmosphere is thin, and it's, uh, it's cold and it's dry, and it's mainly CO2. So let's talk about upper atmospheres. As Nick uh, pointed out, escape to space is uh, the name of the game here. The um, atmospheres generally have a bunch of domains. There's the regular, regular atmosphere, which is what we live in, where things are, where all the different constituents of the atmospheres are well mixed together. It's very homogeneous. Uh, there are lots of collisions going on all the time between the molecules and atoms. And we, uh, we call this the, the main atmosphere, and it ends at some fuzzy boundary that's known as the exobase in many textbooks, although people argue if it's really a sharp boundary or not. It's probably not. Uh, above the exobase, we begin to get, of course, the density is falling off with altitude because of the gravi gravitational stratification of the atmosphere. You finally get to a density where collisions are fewer, and fewer to the extent that they're not, no longer controlling the dynamics of these particles. And so the particles kind of take on the life of a little satellite. Each one is a little satellite. And they can execute various kinds of motions. They can undergo ballistic motion, which still keeps them uh, gravitationally bound to the planet. And those occupy the uppermost reaches of the trapped, gravitationally trapped ends and they can execute satellite-like orbits. They can orbit around. And then there's this population that is actually on a trajectory that can, can escape, provided it has the sufficient energy. And uh, we go back to this diagram. If you have, you took a sample, you took a box, and said, I'm going to analyze the velocities of all the particles, my atmosphere particles in my box, uh, you get a velocity distribution 
and there's a bunch of them that will be going, if there's no wind, uh, there will be this velocity distribution, this is number of particles at different velocities, uh, they'll be centered around zero if there's no wind, and there'll be a bunch that are going down, let's say this is vertical speed, and a bunch that are going up, and the ones that are going up that have this speed in excess of the escape velocity, which is uh, the formula that it showed, are going to be the ones that can make it away. So how do things get into that escape velocity bin? Uh, as Vic said, there's heating uh, is, is one aspect, and, and heating was very important in the history of Mars. Uh, heating basically broadens this velocity distribution, and by broadening this bell curve, you're putting more stuff into this greater than escape velocity bin. But there's also a whole bunch of processes that are classified as non-thermal escape. And non-thermal escape is a mixed bag of anything that can change the velocity distribution, like either upgoing or downgoing, in a way that supplements the escape in here. So we can, uh, these velocities of these molecules and atoms can be changed by chemical reactions, or your particle collisions, or other, other things that you'll see uh, that result from the solar wind interaction. Now, a non-thermal escape process is actually impact. Uh, impact uh, was thought to have adjusted a very low attraction of the original atmospheres of all the planets. Uh, especially the inner planets. And um, there are people who modeled impacts and had flaws. And we are not going to uh, be able to say much more about this. Um, people crater count and estimate how much atmosphere they could have lost on the basis of, of cratering records. Um, but uh, we have to start with the other um, other ways of getting out there real estate. Uh, this is a very important uh, photochemical reaction in a CO2 atmosphere, such as Mars has and Venus has. It is uh, it's called dissociative recombination uh, in the end. Um, a CO2 um, is ionized by sunlight, mainly, uh, in the lower atmosphere. And there's a reaction here with an O atom. And you can see you get, you can see the products here, follow along, uh, an oxygen molecule ionized, and CO comes out. And then there's this, uh, this uh, so we have an oxygen molecule dominated ionosphere of Mars. If you went and you measured its current day ionosphere, uh, you would find it's dominated at its peak uh, electron density by oxygen molecules. And that's just a, a property of, of carbon dioxide atmosphere. The same thing is true with Venus. Then there is this very important process for us called associative recombination of those oxygen molecules where they find an electron that got knocked off somewhere else. And they combine in such a way that these are stars, not pluses here. Uh, these stars mean they're hot. Uh, so th this reaction is such that get energized oxygen atoms out of the recombination of an O2 plus molecule in an electron. And that chemistry uh, is what produces the, what feeds into the medium escape bin a lot of oxygen uh, at a planet like Mars and helps us get rid of oxygen by escape. Uh, with photochemical and non-thermal means. So um, it's important to remember that. Now, uh, that photochemistry is in turn controlled by the sun. Uh, we have, on the sun, you've probably seen these pictures of solar magnetic fields. Uh, solar magnetic fields change with the solar cycle, but they also change uh, in the past, going back into the past. Sun was more like a solar maximum state all the time, and that it eventually died down to the timeline in 
promote solar cycle terms as well as millimeter time scales for the sun. And associated with that magnetic field, there is much variability at the shorter wavelengths of solar emission. So even though um, the bulk of the sun's radiated output, <coughs> the luminosity of the sun was low in the past and uh, grew uh, somewhat as time went on, uh, it seems that the small, the short wavelengths were behaving differently. That probably in the past we had a situation where the, the uh, emissions, which are associated with these magnetic fields and plasmas trapped in hot loops around the sun, uh, were doing a much better job of radiating in X-rays, in ultraviolet, in extreme ultraviolet than they do today on the average. And so um, this, this, these pictures that you see, these are Yoko soft X-ray images, but you can look at images from STO in the EUV or uh, stereo in the EUV, and you can see similar things. The hot radiating loops in the sun, uh, which don't necessarily behave like the overall solar luminosity. They have a life of their own. They're more highly variable. They're more highly connected to the magnetic state of our star the sun. So we have a variability of that photochemistry process tied to solar activity. Uh, so, but that's not the whole story of the sun's effect. That's the photochemistry story. Uh, the sun is also putting out solar wind. You probably also all heard about solar wind. We know something about the properties of the solar wind from long-term measurements, especially at one end of the year. Uh, we have an idea of how the magnetic field of the solar wind behaves. It looks like a spiral because the sun is rotating. Uh, it's being, the solar wind itself is being the hydrogen plasma that's being carried out radially at speeds of hundreds of kilometers per second, typically. Um, it carries the magnetic field of the sun, uh, which at Mars is spreads out radially, so it weakens the distance from the sun, as the density does, uh, is down to only a few nanoteslas in the vicinity of Mars. Its densities are down to only a few protons and electrons per cubic centimeter. But nonetheless, this very rarefied ionized hydrogen gas is flowing out as the solar wind has a host of other uh, non thermal escape processes associated with yeah. Sorry. Can I just clarify, when you say quiet time, you mean when the sun is in quiet mode, these days and not in the past or anything like the sun? Or both. You talk about both. Uh, we don't know what the history of the solar wind is very well at all. Um, it's very difficult to measure. Um, stellar winds this week on solar type stars. So uh, a lot of the history prospecting for solar history is done by looking at solar type stars, but we don't learn very much about the solar wind. So we can presume anything we want. And people have speculated about what a more active sun in the past might have done to the solar wind. Um, but all we know now is that it was at least this, it was probably at least like it is today, over time. Now, uh, this quiet condition is not even quiet in the sense that the solar wind can structure. Um, these weekly lines are time series of in situ plasma and magnetic field measurements uh, that come from near spacecraft of the solar wind, and this is the velocity, and this is density, and the temperature, and the magnetic field strength, and so forth. Uh, all you need to know, really, is this: what's happening in this part, too, is that there are different speed streams coming off of the sun from the different source regions of the solar wind. And they're not all the same speed. And since the sun is rotating, uh, and these different speed streams are going off radially. Uh, you get a situation here where you can have a following high speed, uh, higher speed stream that collides with the slower speed stream in front of it and causes a compression. 
And so the, the, even the quiet solar wind is full of these compression regions. And we see those all the time. And uh, the, the measurements on Mars Express are, are looking at the response of uh, the Mars ion escape to these compression regions and finding some small effect. So even the quiet conditions are not quiet. Just bear that in mind as we go forward. We're not totally homogeneous. But what we do know is that enough about the solar wind that we can model all of this structure. And you can go to the web now and find um, or spaceweather.com and find models like this run all the time. These are based on solar measurements, precisely measurements of the solar magnetic field. And we know enough about the general physics of the solar wind that we can take what's observed on the sun and take the various sources out into the space and the magnetic fields with them and actually numerically calculate what the properties of density and velocity, well, what am I showing here? Um, I'm showing density times radius squared, which is making it more uniform and, and visual to you. Um, you can see these stream interaction regions here forming as the sun rotates. So we know a lot about the solar wind right now, uh, pretty much that what will help us as a main position. Now you've heard that Mars has no strong magnetic field, and that is that is the key uh, to the non-thermal processes related to the solar wind interaction. What you essentially have is if Mars was just sitting out in vacuum with its atmosphere, um, you would have that cartoon that Dick showed in the digital app. Uh, the sun comes along and it ionizes uh, the UV, UV flux, ionizes the day side of that atmosphere, and so you produce ions throughout that upper atmosphere on the day side. It's still sitting there. Nothing happening other than thermal escape. Then comes the solar wind plasma flow. And if it were just the hydrogen plasma by itself um, flowing outward, it's a rarefied ionized gas, it would be absorbed by Mars and its atmosphere. And there would be a, a hole, a wake uh, in the back that's just a result of that having been absorbed on the base side, kind of like the moon. Uh, the Earth's moon is currently. And um, that would be the end of it. There would be no, uh, no particular uh, situation other than something called charge exchange by which uh, solar wind protons uh, pass a grab an electron from a hydrogen atom that might be around Mars and they exchange their velocities. So there would be a little dribbling of escape from charge exchange process, but the main thing happens because there's an interplanetary magnetic field. Uh, these vertical lines represent magnetic field lines. I'm simplifying the spiral configuration here uh, for effect, and they're lying in this plane of the slide, and, but they're actually representing a magnetic field that permeates this hydrogen plasma coming off of the sun. And these magnetic fields are what they call frozen into this plasma. They, they really are stuck to it, like a tracer uh, gas. And, um, and likewise, the ions in the solar wind are stuck to them. And what happens is when the, um, this magnetized plasma sees this ionized upper atmosphere of Mars, it sees it as an obstacle, and it can't penetrate it. And so there's a piling up of the interplanetary field and plasma with it in front of this ionosphere of Mars, which uh, has a little bit of crustal field action in it as well. Uh, but this is the, um, the reason for there being what's called an induced magnetosphere of Mars that's over and above anything that would be there um, from the crustal magnetic fields of Mars and Mars themselves. And this, this is the environment in which the non thermal escape from the solar wind interaction is, is operating. Uh, so the question is, and it's still being debated, is the planetary magnetic field 
of Earth and Mars, a key factor in their differences and the differences in their atmospheres and climates and their the histories of their atmospheres and climates. Uh, as Nick pointed out, we still have the issue that Mars is further from the Sun and Mars is smaller and less massive. Uh, how much of a role did this lack of a planetary magnetic field really play? Did it matter at all? Does it matter at all? And uh, I, people are still arguing about that, so it's not a nowhere near a resolved situation. I'm surprised to hear that connection. That you're saying that there are scientists who think the lack of a magnetic field didn't cause the loss of the atmosphere? That's right. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Maybe. Maybe. If there's a few times today that things that might seem solved out in the mainstream yeah. yeah. It's very clear and solved. <laughs> so if you go on the web, for example, and you look at, you know, magnetospheres shield and shields the planetary atmosphere, you'll find stuff. You'll find discussions, you'll find debates. What, why, if you can say that, okay, why, why do they think that? Well, maybe the lack of magnetic sphere did not cause the loss of the atmosphere. Maybe I'll answer that. Okay. <laughs> if we knew that answer, we wouldn't find payment. I don't know if the loss of magnetic field. That's, that's so, we're going to test it. So one thing we do know is that planets that are magnetized like the Earth are losing atmosphere. It just moves it differently. Okay, so this is a, this is a cartoon sort of a relative to the one I just showed you for a Mars-like body, except the solar wind plasma's magnetic field is being forced around as an obstacle which is much larger and much further from the upper atmosphere than it is at the weakly magnetized Mars. However, uh, people are observing the state all the time on Earth orbiting satellites in uh, features that, that are called polar winds, for example. Um, there's uh, this process called charge exchange, which I briefly mentioned to you, wherein a solar wind proton grabs an electron from an atmospheric hydrogen atom, and the atmospheric atom is charged in turn and goes off by itself in another direction uh, because it's. Uh, there's an exchange of charge between the solar wind particle and an atmospheric particle that gives them a different trajectory as a result. Uh, so that's going on here in the, um, in the upper atmosphere of the Earth, and this polar wind is flowing out of the Earth's polar caps. The mechanism by which that occurs uh, is thought to be related to the auroral activity. Because the solar wind interaction with the Earth, uh, solar wind interaction with the Earth isn't completely closed off from the solar wind. Uh, there are these cusp regions wherein solar wind can enter directly uh, into the Earth's magnetosphere and polar path. And there's also a process called magnetic reconnection with the external magnetic field and the solar wind that reconfigures the connectivity of the Earth field with the solar wind field and sometimes allows a lot more circulation between the two systems than uh, you normally see in a cartoon like this. Uh, in any case, what's happening is that energy is somehow being fed by the solar wind into the polar caps. Uh, because of the interactions of the magnetic fields and flows of the solar wind with the Earth's magnetosphere. Now that energization is producing the particles that precipitate the aurora, but it's also producing particles that flow out. And hydrogen and oxygen are main participants in that polar wind outflow. Now this polar wind outflow is currently about the same uh, size in terms of flux of particles as the escaping ions on Mars, which we will talk about next. So there is the process of, we call it cusp ion, there's something called the cusp ion found. Uh, there's a classic polar wind, helium is also a participant in that. And the oxygen is more variable, uh, it tends to be a greater uh, 
uh, how slow when the war is active, it's very active. Um, but one thing to remember about the Earth's magnetosphere is that not all the particles that flow out of the polar cap may necessarily escape to space. Some may stay circulating and populating uh, the magnetosphere itself. And that's still being looked at. So here we are back at a weakly magnetized planet like Mars. And these are the processes, the counterparts that work at these planets. Um, the concepts are um, a little harder to grasp because they have to do with how particles behave in magnetic and electric fields. Uh, but there are, are several basic ones that we like to focus on because we think they're particularly important, although we may be finding processes that uh, we think they're not important, are much more important than anticipated. Uh, so here's the hot escaping neutrals from the exosphere from the thermal processes and photochemical heating. Uh, so that, that's this bunch here. Um, then there's a bunch of ions that are produced both uh, outside of the solar wind because there's the boundary between the ionosphere of Mars and the solar wind plasma exists within the atmosphere. So there's plenty of atmosphere still outside this boundary. Uh, but the, some of the fields can still leak into the inside of this obstacle and have the same effect. And take some of the ions that have been produced by sunlight uh, in particular, but they're also produced by other processes like particle impact ionization and uh, charge exchange. Uh, but let's say for discussion purposes that these are produced by solar ionization of the atmosphere on the basin. Uh, they get to this um, situation where they can be so-called picked up by the solar wind. Now what is pick up? Um, charged particles, when they perceive a magnetic field, are compelled to cycle, to gyrate around. They just say, I have to, here's a magnetic field here, I have to gyrate. And in the case of this solar wind interaction, these magnetic fields are being conducted past the planet by the solar wind. So they're not stationary magnetic fields, they're moving. And so the particles begin to gyrate around the magnetic fields, but because the magnetic fields are moving by, around, and over this obstacle, uh, these particles are gyrating, but they're moving into sunward with that solar wind. So the pickup process is, is essentially the particle has become ionized, it perceives the solar wind magnetic field, it starts gyrating, and it starts moving with the solar wind field. If the solar wind field were not there, we would not have this ion pickup process. Uh, so uh, pickup ions can get very uh, get the very high energies. The solar wind moves at you know hundreds of kilometers per second. You're starting with the ion that's practically stationary, and all of a sudden you're you're hefting it up to that speed. The escape velocity on Mars is about five kilometers per second. And here you are, you're picking up an oxygen ion and you're starting to move it at up to hundreds of kilometers per second. So um, you're really introducing a lot of energy into this ionized uh, population of pickup ions, which can be produced on both sides of this obstacle boundaries. Now, not all of these um, gyrating ions are going to get swept away into the far reaches of the solar system. Uh, some of them are going to start getting accelerated and actually get ran back into the the substantial atmosphere of Mars, the exophase, the lower atmosphere, so that they're depositing the energy that they picked up, that they got from the solar wind, back into the atmosphere. And in turn, uh, when that happens, um, it's kind of a little like an auroral process in the sense that particles are depositing energy. Uh, but they're depositing energy in such a way that they could be 
causing a backslash, uh, which is called sputtering, of whatever <coughs> atoms are there in their path. And so in addition to the direct escape of pickup ions, pickup ions are producing a sputtered population of, of escaping particles. So all this non-thermal stuff is going on simply because the solar wind is there. You've got um, non-thermals from photochemistry, and you've got non-thermals from this solar wind interaction. But this is just a little cartoon of the sputtering process. Um, where the particles are coming in with their energization to the solar wind, they're hitting other atoms when they hit the collisional atmosphere, and they're producing a cascade of collisions, of particles going every which way. A few of them will be ejected with escape velocity. So, so an interesting point is that the returning escape, returning pickup ions that don't escape into escaping could be a pretty important process, it turns out. So early Mars uh, was a complicated scene. There were impacts, there were the volcanic outgassing, there was photochemistry going on, and uh, these uh, solar wind-related processes all about pickup and sputtering. And of course on the surface, there were surface atmosphere interactions going on too. Uh, the current Mars is pretty much the same on some ends. It's not that the impact going on and the photochemical speed has changed, but it's still happening. And all these solar wind interaction related processes are still happening. And so even though things might have changed in the magnitudes at which they're occurring, we can still go and look at what's controlling them, how they work, how important each one is, and see if we can um, make estimations of what's happened over time from each one. Now people have already estimated escape rates from the different processes. And they tend to look at it in terms of atoms per second or molecules per second. And then they change it into a water equivalent or a carbon dioxide uh, thickness pressure or the pressure equivalent. And what we already know is that to get rid of the atmosphere and water that we think have been on Mars, loss rates in general would have to be much greater than these ones are estimated from our known loss processes. And so in current Maven's question, one of them, is if the current processes are the answer to where the atmosphere is gone, could these rates have gotten high enough in the past to have made them work effectively at removing what we think has been there? What are the units for water? Water equivalent is meters. Meters depth. A global equivalent ocean meters depth. And this is millibars of atmospheric pressure. Yeah. So the current Mars atmosphere pressure is 10 millibars, and people think at least 10 times as much as there. And um, this is the water equivalent that we get. We estimate, or some of us, there are many estimates out there that will range um, plus or minus an order of magnitude of these numbers. Yeah. Is that as though water was covering global Mars? That's that as if water was covering global Mars. It, that's a standard way of expressing in a global or the one ocean thing. <coughs> that, that's what we can lose at present no, rates. It's so it's, it's not, not very it's not a very deep ocean. And it's not near what people think has been there in the past. Right. Nor has this, you know, we think we can lose by sputtering in part. Uh, one millibar of the CO2 atmosphere, but people think that there was much more than that back then, uh, at the beginning of modern Mars. So we have to we have to see what could have. Do we understand these rates well enough, and the history of everything else well enough to make the argument that both these processes did the job and that they could have been high enough in the past? what's required. Here's an example. Uh, 
If you go on the web, you can find estimates of the volume of the early ocean of Mars, cubic kilometers of water. It's based on the surface features. And this is one number I found, I think, in Wikipedia of those uh, sites. Uh, this amount, I figured, contained about uh, two times 10 to the 45 H2O molecules. Now, it's relatively easy to get rid of white hydrogen by beating the curve. And so, if the, you know, the EUV flux of the sun was higher in the past, the sun was more magnetically active, uh, hydrogen might have been no problem. What, what is, um, in the top line, you got bonding? But how much your depth is that? Well, yeah. I don't have a way to, I want to relate well, that to your well, three well, meters. <laughs> how does that relate to the three meters? I think it's, only, it's larger than three meters, but I haven't figured out what the depth is. Um, I mean, you can divide by the area of the planet. Meters. The area is 1.8 times 10 to the 14, um, okay. 10 to the 18 square centimeters. So this is cubic kilometers, and I'm <coughs> interested in the previous in meters. So you would have to sit down but with this That's what I'm asking. Yeah, I don't have it off the top of my head. I didn't uh, translate this number to an, uh, an equivalent ocean depth. Give me, give me 30 seconds. Okay. I'll calculate it. I think it's 400 and something if I'm doing it's, that. Yeah, right. it's bigger than 3 meters. 400 and what? Mm -hmm. Meters. So, um, this was from Wikipedia. Yeah, I mean, I was just curious about the estimates. You know, people have used, have examined the, the global surface features and, and looked at all the gullies and channels and figured out the volume of them. And, and from that, they estimate what the volume of the water would have been. There are, there are several estimates. This particular one. Um, anyway, what, what I was after was we look at things in the escape world in terms of atoms per second, getting rid of so many atoms of oxygen per second, for example, in particular. And um, so oxygen is harder to get rid of than hydrogen because it's heavier. But we've seen that there are processes that can get rid of oxygen. There's this photochemical process, and there's also the solar wind interaction related processes of sputtering and ion pickup. Uh, so if I want to get rid of this oxygen, in this ocean over the three and a half billion years that I'm allowed, uh, how much would that rate have to be? And in the previous slide, you saw numbers uh, that were like 10 to the 25th, 10 to the 26th per second, atoms per second. And here you have the meeting at least 10 to the 28th. <coughs> So you need hundreds of times higher escape rates in, in order to affect the loss of this amount of water. It, that's how the oxygen in that water got lost. And do you need to get rid of all the water to explain what the CLS That's what we're doing here. Right. Or at least infer the water from the channels. I'd say most of it, like, uh, because some of it is definitely right. 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 So you can't freeze an ocean. An ocean right. under the surface. So most of it has requires a different explanation. So that some of some of it. I mean some of that water, like the whole of it, is what Phoenix was. Some of that is like well, it doesn't it doesn't add it adds up to meters, not hundreds of meters. People have done pretty good budgets of both CO2 and, and H2O in the polar caps, and it's not enough. Yeah. 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 So we're going back to the sun, uh, sun and the sun's role. Uh, so as I mentioned, the, uh, the study of sunlight stars is what we have to rely on for getting solar history. And we, believe from what's observed that the sun was more magnetically active in the past in general. Um, and of course that meant higher UV flux probably and uh, that's, that's what we think has happened. Uh, astronomers 
provide plots of this kind where you have the, the long age uh, years from the present and you have this long luminosity of the extreme ultraviolet flux of solar like stars. Extreme ultraviolet flux here was defined as short word, wavelength short word of a thousand angstroms. And you see that from the present going back, uh, you get on average a factor of four is what people think, factors of six, sometimes you get factors of ten. Sometimes you can see factors of a hundred uh, if, if it's going way back in time. Uh, so there's a lot of um, error bar in this, but I think there's pretty general agreement that solar type stars been more active in their past, which means that they were higher in the UV emissions, but they were higher in other things too. Other things being magnetic activities on the sun, on the stars. Uh, and we know a lot more about solar activity today, uh, thanks to heliophysics research and observations we have of space weather uh, <coughs> generated by solar activity. Since 1990, in particular, it's been appreciated that these, um, these eruptions that are called coronal mass ejections are probably the biggest players in producing space weather effects. Uh, flares are related to coronal mass ejections, but they are mainly the photon burst. They're short-lived, intense photon bursts. Uh, coronal mass ejections are can be big, fast gusts of solar wind uh, that can uh, last for days at a time, and they can be pretty much a couple of times a day thing on the modern sun and solar mass. Now, the, those coronal mass ejection events have many parts to them. Uh, the, this simulation doesn't have a lot of the details of what people think is going on when the sun blasts off a piece of its corona. Uh, but it gets this um, blast wave kind of bleeding edge effect, which is a shock forming compression of the solar wind because this piece of ejected corona is moving much faster than the 300 kilometer per second average solar wind. It's going through it at a called super magnetosonic speed, and so it drives a, a bow wave of shock ahead of it, uh, which produces, which is associated with compressions, large compressions in the density, and magnetic field in the solar wind, and also heating in the solar wind. And so these things are going by the planets all the time, and they're what cause geomagnetic storms on the Earth and all the effects associated with geomagnetic storms. <coughs> Yeah. How much time do you think you can finish? Oh, um, I think I can finish in about seven minutes. Okay, so we'll have a pretty quick discussion here. So, uh, coronal mass ejections <coughs> produce larger disturbances, a similar plot to what I showed before for the solar wind stream interactions. Uh, these, these perturbations of the solar wind density, temperature, velocity, and so forth. Uh, are much larger in the coronal mass ejection uh, events going by a planet than the stream interaction regions produce. Uh, the coronal mass ejections also include these knotted up magnetic fields from the sun as part of the driver gas component. Um, there's also solar energy particles. You've probably seen these chronograph images that uh, this one develops a little more slowly than I would like. Uh, big snowstorms uh, that hit this, when the, the solar energy particles hit the CCTV camera, and they come at almost, you know, they don't come at the speed of light, but they come faster than any other signature of a coronal mass ejection. It's the first signature of a coronal mass ejection you get is headed your way for the solar energy particles. Then comes the big shot a couple of days later. In fact, there's a timeline that we know about for space weather, and Nathan's going to watch this timeline with all of its in-situ instrumentation. Um, the flare will be seen uh, 
uh, by the UV instruments, and then there's going to be uh, institute plasma and part energetic particle measurements that measure the, um, the solar energetic particle fluxes. This is an electron flux and an uh, energetic proton flux coming by with this hypothetical uh, timeline for in situ chronal mass ejection signatures. Magnetic field will come by, you'll see the shock following the solar energetic particle onset. The shock comes by a couple of days' time and it greatly disturbs the environment, plasma, and magnetic fields uh, for days, days on end. So starting with the prompt solar energetic particles and then following by the several day magnetic cloud, each of these events that's uh, head on to you might last for a week. And so their frequency is going to determine how often you're exposed to this much more extreme kind of environment. And these are just little uh, tags that say what I just said. So I don't, well, now we, we know these energize the Earth's polar ionosphere and these atmosphere heating, the auroras, and related ionosphere of the Earth. And we know that they hit comets and they tear off comet tails like that. Um, and comets are also unprotected by magnetic fields. So Maven is going to be out there exposed to all this, and we're going to be able, because of our measurement complement, which Bruce will talk about, uh, do diagnostics of all of these different things that are going on, and determine a little better how they work, and the extent to which they drive the atmospheric escape rates, and whether the atmospheric escape rates respond uh, to these things in a way that enhances these it breaks enough to make it. And so the solar cycle context of Maven is very important as you'll see again later on. And we're uh, happy to even though it's a small solar cycle from the solar sunspot point of view, it's still pretty active in the coronal mass ejection area. And we're going to see what happens uh, at Mars.
on the average. But then you have these storms. Um, if, if the early sun was more active and CMEs were occurring all the time, like, at least like they are at solar maximum today, then yes, you have episodes, got storms. It wouldn't be, a, you know, people try to project the solar wind back in time as if it's a smooth laminar thing that just got stronger. But it's probably more like the solar maximum we have today. It's probably a much more gusty, boosty, <coughs> disturbed kind of wind. So the solar wind, in a way, becomes entirely transient, dominated, uh, storm dominated. That's what I was driving at with. Would CMEs be a, a driver of this, this degradation of the atmosphere? Would they have stripped away more than, say, just the, the normal solar? That's what we're hoping to find. That's how we're hoping to get the rates up to where they need to be, in part. This is more an Earth question. Uh, we were saying at the beginning, I believe, that you know, we really don't know that much about Earth, even though we have said certain right here. Uh, and kids, teachers, the general public, Thank you. 